Hey guys, so we need to finally have a little chat about Retrobrite. If there's such a thing as a trending topic in retro gaming, Retrobrite is it. In fact, every time I show off my Apple IIc here, somebody invariably suggests that I Retrobrite it. So I thought it's a good time to kind of talk about what Retrobrite is, why you might want to do it to some of your systems, and then play a little devil's advocate and talk about why I haven't done it to this system and some of my others and why you might not want to do it to all of yours either. And if you do decide to do it, I've actually done some semi-scientific tests. I've tested out some of the various assumptions and some of the myths about Retrobrite, and I'm going to show you kind of the most time efficient and best way to do it based on what I've found. So let's just get started. So first, what the heck is Retrobrite? Well, you probably know already if you're into retro gaming or computers at all, but if you're just starting out, here's a short primer. See, certain types of light-colored plastics turn yellow over time. You've no doubt seen this before, as it's basically unavoidable with some machines. The SNES is one of the most notorious offenders, but anything made from brominated ABS will turn almost banana yellow over time, or sometimes almost more of a puke green. This is caused by both light and heat, and it's almost unavoidable unless you keep your systems boxed up in a wine cellar. Witness my Apple IIc, or my Atari 520ST keyboard when I first received it. For a really long time, we all thought we just had to live with this. It was just cosmetic after all. It actually became difficult to even remember exactly what certain machines ever originally looked like, because basically all of them had yellowed, and even the pictures we had weren't all that accurate or well-preserved. We didn't have digital photography or even photo storage at all until the 90s. But about a decade ago now, somebody came up with the idea of using a peroxide-based formula with a catalyst to try to reverse the chemical process that causes the yellowing. You put this on the thing you're retrobriting, cover it in clear plastic wrap, or in my case, put them in Ziploc bags, and stick it in the sun for a while, and presto, no more yellowing, or at least less of it. Over a few years, the formula was refined until it became kind of idiot-proof. Hey, even I can do it. And I've done it to my Atari ST and Atari 800XL, my Apple IIgs keyboard, my Tandy 1000 keyboard, and my Commodore 64, among other things. It usually works so well, in fact, that you might be tempted to retrobrite everything you own. Or at least write a bunch of YouTube comments telling other people that they should. But before I tell you the best way I've found to do it, I just want to play devil's advocate a bit because there are some really good reasons why you might not want to do it, and why I haven't done it myself to more of my own stuff. Number one, it's temporary. Now, this wasn't commonly known until just a couple of years ago, although it's kind of common sense. You're not changing the type of plastic that it is, and you're not changing its physical properties. All you're doing is changing the color on the surface. So the yellowing is going to come back, and a lot of people who have done this report that the yellowing comes back a lot quicker than it originally did. In fact, I did this Apple IIgs keyboard just about six months ago, and I swear it's already yellowing again. So if you're going to do this, plan on doing it at least every couple of years. Two, potential problems, streaking, blooming, and going too far. Retrobriting is not a completely foolproof process. You can end up with blooming, where the edges are slightly brighter than the rest. You can end up with streaking through the rest of the body of whatever you're doing. And you can also just go too far. Breadbin Commodore 64s were always brown. Atari XLs, like that one, were always beige and dark brown. They were not light gray, and neither were Commodore 64s. Now, remember when I said that we don't really have good references for a, the way a lot of these systems really used to look. Well, that means that you never really know how far you should go with retrobriting. It's really up to the individual person. And I have seen a lot of systems where whoever did it has just gone way too far and it's gotten, gotten way too light. It is possible to remove all the color from something. You're basically bleaching the surface. Number three, all that yellowing is yours, if you've owned something for a long time. My Apple IIc, for example, has been with me since 1985, when it was new. And all this yellowing that you see here, that happened as I owned it, and I actually remember the different stages of it yellowing. Now, I don't particularly like the yellowing, it's not that, but it does speak to the history of this machine. And I want to keep it that way. 
I don't necessarily want it to be some color that kind of approximates what it was when I first bought it when it was new. I want it to look like the older machine that it is that I've had for almost, well, definitely my entire adult life and even much of my childhood. So that's why I haven't done this and maybe you feel the same about some of your machines. Number four, CRT issues and not matching everything just looks weird. CRTs are very tricky to retrobright. They have a lot of vents, they have a lot of holes for various knobs and things like that. And so you really have to take them out of the case as you generally want to do with a computer as well. But with a CRT, it's really mandatory. You don't want to be getting liquid inside the CRT housing, but Taking a CRT out of a case is very tricky and actually dangerous if you don't know what you're doing and you don't know how to handle yourself around large capacitors. Now that's even assuming that the case itself is in good enough condition to handle. Uh, a few years back, uh, I had a Sony CRT TV, which was only really about 15 years old. The case around it started to crack when we moved it. And as we moved it more, uh, I had given it to my mom, actually, and we moved it to her house, and more cracks appeared. We decided, well, we've just got to get rid of this. We called a junk company, actually, to take it away. It was a pretty big set, and when they picked it up, the entire case just crumbled around them, and the, the tube itself imploded. Now, CRTs are under a lot of internal pressure. They're designed not to injure you if they implode, but they can implode and you really don't want that happening while you're handling a CRT. As old as CRTs, all of these CRTs are these days, it's really not worth taking one apart unless you know exactly what you're doing just to do something that's completely cosmetic. So given that, I don't think it's worth doing a CRT and Mismatched systems, I think, just look stupid. So in that case, best to just leave the whole thing alone. Number five, if planning to sell, buyers can tell. This may not apply to everybody. In fact, it may only apply to certain cases. But if you are planning to sell something or you think you might sell something really ever, buyers can tell when something's been retrobrighted. Now, not all of them care, but it is kind of like having a refinished guitar or a power washed piece of ancient pottery uh, you just you'd you'd rather see something the way it really is and uh, there are definite tells that something's been retrobrighted of course like I talked about earlier a lot of times the color is off you might see blooming or streaking sometimes the accessories might not match when you're selling something which is kind of like the carpet not matching the drapes if you know what I mean so, you know, it's up to you in that case if you think the uh, kind of the jury's still out on whether this affects price positively or negatively when you sell something. My take as a collector would be I don't want something that's been retrobrighted by somebody else. I don't know how well it's been done. Uh, I don't know if it's going to have affected the plastic. Um, you know, if I'm going to retrobrite something, I want to do it myself. And generally, I would only do that for things that I don't really care about, if you know what I mean. Uh, things that I don't have any sort of attachment to and things that aren't worth really any money, but that I just want to look their best. Um, for example, I did do my Atari ST here. This is a recent purchase. I have no emotional attachment to it. And it really looked awful when I got it. So it definitely looks better now. Um, and I probably would have bought it like this, even knowing that it had been retrobrighted. But, uh, you know, this was a cheap purchase. If I was buying something as a collector's item, something that was rarer, you know, if you've got like a very early original Apple II, which are going for crazy prices these days, I would not retrobrite that. I would keep it exactly how it is. Now again, maybe you just want to do this for yourself, something that I've done many times myself. So I did a few tests to see what the best possible way was to do it. Now, not all of these were completely scientific and not all of them are visually represented in anything that I'm going to show you, but some of them are. But I knew that retrobrite was based on certain things. It's a hydrogen peroxide solution. It starts with hydrogen peroxide. 
in as high a concentration as you can get. It has an oxygen catalyst, and it often or generally has some kind of stabilizer like xanthan gum that uh, can turn it into kind of a paste or a gel to make it stick better to whatever you put it on and allows you to use less as well. And I knew that it also requires light. Generally, it's thought that UV light is what it needs, and the sun is the best provider of UV light. Failing that, you can get a black light. So I wanted to test as much of this out as possible. So I did some individual tests. Then I actually took a spare Apple IIgs case that I had lying around, and I masked off four different areas to try some different things on it. Here's what I found. Number one, the formula. Now, I will say that I tried just plain old hydrogen peroxide on the keys of my Atari ST, and it did absolutely nothing. My conclusion from that is that if the catalyst isn't totally necessary, it sure as hell helps. Uh, I got this nice look here using the oxygen catalyst later. Now, where I am, it's kind of impossible to get xanthan gum or anything like that, or hydrogen peroxide in any kind of high concentration, really. So I did what some people have suggested, including the 8-Bit Guy and other famous people on YouTube, and I went to a beauty supply store and I bought this. This is Clairol 40 Cream Developer, and this is basically Retrobrite in a bottle. Uh, it has the hydrogen peroxide in a fairly high concentration, and this is, in my area at least, this is the only way to legally buy it in this high of a concentration. And it has an oxygen catalyst, and uh, it also has a stabilizer that turns it into kind of a gel, uh, well, or a cream, but it's really more of a gel. Now, you do have to be careful if you buy stuff in a bottle, because all of these have different additives in them. And you really have to look at the ingredients, and uh, they're down here, and it's kind of hard to know what's good and what's not. I actually looked at a couple different brands while I was in the store, and I looked up all these ingredients and found that most of these, I mean, well, all of these on this particular bottle are not going to hurt plastic. There are some brands that have stronger acids that may potentially be harmful to plastic. So in this case, the brand actually does matter. And uh, Clairol, I found, very safe and as foolproof as Retrobrite can be. Number two, applying it. Now, as far as applying it, I come from the Bob Ross school of the two-inch house paint brush. There's no need to get fancy. You see, I even have some... Uh, some old Retrobrite still on that. There's no need to get fancy with foam brushes or sponges or anything like that. Just a two inch house paint brush. It gets in all the little nooks and crannies. Uh, this cream developer and probably any uh, Retrobrite that you yourself might make if you do choose to go that route, it's about the consistency of a thick house paint anyway. So uh, two inch brush works just fine. Number three, adding light, and here's where the masked off 2GS came in, along with my semi-scientific tests. Now, once you've applied the Retro Bright and covered it in plastic somehow, and you can either use saran wrap or you can use something like a Ziploc bag, that's where I wanted to test the light, and that's where this old 2GS case comes in. Now, I masked off, again, four different sections, and I wanted to test different types of light. They're not all visually represented here, but um, I'll just tell you everything that I tested and kind of go through, and I'll show you some close-ups of what I did. Now, I kept one section here as a control. This I did nothing to. In fact, this section did not even get any light during any of the tests. So this is exactly as yellow as it was originally. Now, the first thing that I did was actually take this piece of tape off here, apply Retrobrite, and let it sit in my basement with no light whatsoever for 24 hours just to see if light was really necessary at all. For all I knew, the Retrobrite could be doing all the work. But after 24 hours, there was basically no change whatsoever. So yes, you do need light. The next question was what kind and for how long? So I retreated the same section and I put it outside in the sun for five hours. Now, in my area, five hours of direct sunlight is probably about the most you're going to get during a day, given 
the angle of the sun, various obstructions, clouds, things like that. It's very rare for us to get a completely sunny day all day long. So five hours in the sun, I took a look at it after washing it off, and there's a definite improvement versus the control side. And that was to be expected because I had done this before. So sunlight does work. The longer you put it out, the more brightening you're going to get. And to my eyes at that time, with the other two sections blocked off, this looked like a noticeable difference. Now next, I remasked that original side, unmasked the second area, and applied the RetroBrite again. Then I just stuck it under my shop lights for five hours. My shop lights are just standard 3100K tube lights. They're, uh, you know, as you may see in an office or something like that, they're 40 watts each, 80 watts total and they're designed specifically to filter out UVA and UVB light. So I stuck them under there for five hours to compare directly to the sunlight, and of course, after five hours, there was no change. Well, I decided, let's just go for broke, try it again, try it for 24 hours this time. I reapplied the RetroBrite to the same area, stuck them back under the shop lights for 24 hours, with the thinking being that we get five hours of direct sunlight in a day, so I'm still comparing one day's worth of light. And wouldn't you know, after a full day under the shop lights, it's actually brighter than the side with the sunlight. So that tells me you don't necessarily need specifically UVA or UVB light. You just need some kind of light. And, you know, maybe there's a tiny bit of UVA and UVB coming through on my shop lights, but my next test kind of proved to me that that's not what's going on here. In my next test, I remasked the shop light area, actually remasked both of these, unmasked this area, applied the RetroBrite, and put them under black lights for first, again, five hours, no change again, then again, 24 hours. Now, the black lights that I used are not the sort of reptile lights that some people recommend. I used, again, T12 F48, very big lights. They put out a lot of black light, 80 watts total of UVA and UVB light. They filter out every other kind of light and are designed only to output UVA and UVB. Now, I wasn't convinced after reading some other forum posts that it was the exact right wavelength that I was going to need, but given this result, I was still hopeful. And yes, after 24 hours, I got basically the same result as the shop lights. And this is with a whole lot more UVA and UVB light than this. Even if there was a little, get, a little bit getting through with the shop lights, with the black light, there's a lot more, and yet still I got basically the same result. So that tells me you do need light, and sunlight is still the preferred choice for me for one reason, and that's that it's a lot more even. You do get more streaking and kind of blotchiness if you leave something under any other kind of light for a long period of time, and my guess is that's just a result of the time and the RetroBrite solution sitting on the plastic for a lot longer. So sunlight's better if you can manage to get two days worth of sunlight, but if you do happen to live in an area like northern Alaska or Scandinavia where you don't get a lot of sunlight for a large part of the year, you do have alternatives and you don't even really need a black light. You can just use basic fluorescent lights as long as they're strong enough and you give them enough time you're still going to get a pretty good result. So that's all you really need to know about RetroBrite. It's not really worth bothering to make your own mixture. Just buy it, spread it on, cover it in either clear plastic or a Ziploc bag, and stick it in the brightest light you can until you feel the colors back to normal. But keep checking because RetroBrite doesn't know when to stop. And don't go nuts with it. Some things just weren't meant to be RetroBrited.